Rockabye baby, thy cradle is green. Father's a nobleman, mother's a queen. Almost infinite versions of this rhyme have been sung and many published since it first appeared in the Mother Goose Songs of the Nursery. One interpretation of this famous English lullaby is about the son of King James II of England and Mary of Modena. It is widely believed that the boy was not their son at all, but a child who was brought into the birthing room and passed off as their own in order to ensure a Roman Catholic heir to the throne. Well, no one can regard or discard such wild speculation, but nevertheless, numerous attempts have been made to do just so. And in this episode, I will take a look at some of the origins of these rhymes and how they go on inspiring the adult world with strange myths, tall tales and mysteries. Hello and welcome to the Book Fetish Channel. This is the part two of I Saw Eso episode. If you haven't seen the first part of this episode, do click on the link below to check out the first video or hold on till the end screen. And if you do find it interesting, please subscribe. Just about three years ago, I emigrated to England from India. And needless to say, the culture shock was grappling my bones. Then came Easter and my English husband brought some hot cross buns and chanted rather awkwardly. Hot cross buns, hot cross buns, one a penny, two a penny, hot cross buns. If your daughters do not like them, give them to your sons. But if you haven't any of this pretty little elves, then eat them yourselves. It was formerly a street cry around 1733 and became a calendar folk chant sung by children on a Good Friday. And I received this book as my Easter present. The Oxford Dictionary of Nursery Rhyme by Iona and Peter A.P. A couple who devoted their lives recording 500 years of oral history. That may not seem like a long way back, but it turns out that nursery rhymes were not that ancient as some would like to believe. In fact, the term nursery rhyme was not mentioned anywhere earlier than in the Blackwoods Edinburgh magazine for July 1984. And we also have to consider that there were few juvenile publications available before 1740. That is because a lot of these verses published before 1800 were not meant for children at all. These rhymes were originally used as seemingly innocent vehicles to spread scandalous news, gossip of the court, cheeky ballads and politics of the day. In 18th century, these rhymes were simply known as songs or ditties, famously popular as Tommy Thumb's songs. Ba ba black ship, have you any wool? Yes, Mary, have I three bags full. How can anyone think of this little rhyme as anything but a child's amusement? Sure, it flourished in the nursery for hundreds of years, but in the wool trade of 1200, it was a strong critic concerning the division of the bags preferred to the export tax imposed on farmers in 1275. Baba Blackship first appeared in Tomitham nearly 200 years ago. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to fetch her poor dog a bone. But when she came there, the cupboard was bare, and so the poor dog has none. Old Mother Hubbard got enormously publicised, but not amongst the children. It was mistaken as a political squabble and became instantaneously popular among mature generation. The poem was speculated to have been written as a mockery of Cardinal Thomas Woolsey, who refused to grant an annulment to King Henry VIII to marry Anne Boleyn. Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star is one of the best-known poems in the English language. I have a couple of friends named after this poem and I bet they would like to know the backstory. It was returned by Jane Taylor in 1783 and first appeared in Nursery Rhyme in 1806. But it seems that for some peculiar reason, most of Taylor's work suffered a huge amount of parody. An example being the Lewis Carroll's Mad Hatter's Outburst. Some say to survive it, you need to be as mad as a hatter. Twinkle, twinkle, little bat, how I wonder what you are at. Up above the world you fly, like a tea tray in the sky. Parodies are one thing, but then there are faultless logics. Three wise men of Gotham, they went to sea in a bowl. And if the bowl had been stronger, my song had been longer. 
Now, for those of you who have immediately pictured Batman sliding down the high rises in Dark Knight, where Gotham is a brooding New York City, constantly on the brink of destruction, you're in for a surprise. The real Gotham could not be more different. Gotham means a goat's town in Anglo-Saxon. And it is actually a name of a little English village in Nottinghamshire. In Middle Ages, Gotham was proverbial for the stupidity of its inhabitants. However, the reason for this behaviour is believed to be that the villagers wish to feign madness to avoid a royal highway being built through their village. But when Washington Irving, the author of satirical periodical Salama Gundi, first started using the term Gotham for New York in 1807, he was poking a little fun at the city and its residents by comparing it to a village where people pretended to be crazy. Getting back to nursery. Little maid, pretty maid, why the goes thou? Down in the forest to milk my cow. Shall I go with thee? No, not now. When I send for thee, then come thou. Ooh, a saucy invitation. In some part of England, to ask a girl if one might go milking with her was considered to be a proposal of marriage. The power of nursery rhymes has shown itself as the basis for powerful political satire. I incite the women in Britain to rebellion. In 1912, the suffragettes published a little pamphlet called Mother Goose as a Suffragette. Jack and Jill have an equal will, an equal strength of mind. But when it comes to equal right, poor Jill trails far behind. The use of children's literature to propagate political satire in print culture had already been widely used since the 17th century. The suffragettes took up this tradition to demand the vote for women. Here is an example from 1800 where a rhyme flourished as a political satire. It was borrowed from the nursery, but not contained by the nursery. This is the house that Jack built. This is the mould that lay in the house that Jack built. This is the rat that ate the mould that lay in the house that Jack built. And the rhyme goes on. But in December 1819, William Hone published The Political House That Jack Built in the wake of the Peterloo Massacre, when public sentiments were still high. He was inspired by the house that Jack built, and the book was illustrated by a visual satiric George Cruikshank. What resulted was one of the most ferocious, vicious and socially provoking political satire ever to come out of Europe. In 1950, this rhyme inspired another great mind, the American poetess Elizabeth Bishop, and she wrote the poem Visit to the St. Elizabeth. This is the house of Bedlam. Just when I thought that the house that Jack built had enough, I found this. Your house is a fine little house, Jack. The soul belongs to heaven and the body to hell. I have yet to watch it, but if you have, please leave your views in the comment below. I will leave you with this until the next book comes between my hands. And if you want to be notified for further videos, do not forget to subscribe to my channel, The Book Fetish.